And we welcome you in once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the very busy intersection of faith and reason as it is each week. And I'm Doug Keck, your host, coming to you, of course, from the mothership, as we'd say, where Mother Angelica began it all back in 1981 in Irondale, Alabama. And we wish you to email your questions to us at spitzersuniverse at ew10.com because that's what helps drive the show. And of course, we'd like you to get informed. So check out Father Spitzer's Magic Center website, CredibleCatholic.com, and his new website, PurposefulUniverse.com. And next week, there might be another one. You never know. They, they keep multiplying here. And of course, the show is always available on EW10's On Demand, and we want to that's on the web, so if you have friends who don't get EW10 normally, go to the web and they can watch the show on demand or on our YouTube channel as well, as long as Father's answers are, are politically correct, that is. And of course, our show topic is uh, Signs of Demonic Possession from Father's book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives, naturally available through the EW10 Religious Catalog. We assume you have it already. If you don't, uh, what's taking you so long? The book of the month from EW10 Publishing is Graceful Living by the one and only Johnette Benkovic, of course, Williams, uh, meditation help you grow closer to God day by day. And it's great, especially at the beginning of the year, uh, a great uh, gift to give somebody if you miss them at Christmas time. And with that being said, we turn to Father Spitzer, who will lead us in prayer. Thank you, Father. In the name of, sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing especially of this ministry and our ability to participate in it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us today, Doug, myself, our whole audience, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. Great to see you. Hope everything is well with you. All is well. <laughs> Good. Let's get to a couple of uh, stories in the paper in the last week or so. I thought this was a story that kind of popped up over the last month or so, but I wanted to ask yeah. you about it because having been a college president, and it's about that yeah. uh, male swimmer, who's uh, swimming for the University of Pennsylvania as a transgender swimmer, Leah Thomas, uh, yeah. and competing against uh, women here in, uh, you know, in the Ivy League competition and basically yep. shattering records. And uh, one comment yeah. this person made here was, I think everybody secretly knows that everybody thinks this isn't really right. What would, what would be your situation, what would be your take if you were dealing with this when you were at Gonzaga? Yeah. Well, I would, first of all, be asking the women athletes and the women coaches, and uh, you would get the truth in a hurry. I don't think any of them like it. I think they think it is a real travesty to sports, and I think what they're doing is using a person's, uh, basically, um, their uh, so-called um, identity, gender identity, which they consider to be purely psychological, mm -hmm. and confusing it with actually authenticating their biological gender identity, um, which of course um, um, is uh, not the same at all. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the point is, is just because you believe that you are um, of a different gender or you have uh, physical operations that make you seem uh, to appear a little bit more like the other gender, you are not really mm -hmm. biologically the other gender, and you should not be um, uh, allowed to compete on that basis. Mm -hmm. uh, the the you know ability to compete must be based on the biological facts of the person, right. not on their perceived self-identity. So I think right. the and the answer to that question would be handled very easily if you just ask the right. women athletes and the women coaches. Well, it would be like somebody who's 18 years old suddenly deciding they identified as a 10-year-old and wanted to play in the 10-year-old league, uh, <laughs> yeah. right? And exactly. uh, say, well, I think exactly. I'm 10 and was dominating, yeah. uh, you know, that, yeah. uh, that league with their performance because uh, they were obviously yeah. so much older and hence so much, uh, 
you know, uh, yeah. more developed. Throwing 100 mile per hour idea. pitches at the 10 year olds. Yeah. Right, exactly. Exactly. I, I, exactly. Yeah. That's why we, we do those things. Here was another, uh, and, yeah. and, and part of this came up uh, before Christmas. We talked a little bit about it. It's uh, Archivich of Gomez from um, Los Angeles, huh? who you know well, of course. Yeah. Um, sure. And, 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 and he pointed out in a couple of talks, one all the way back in, in November and then uh, in Madrid and another one after that, about the idea mm -hmm. of this kind concept we're dealing with in the world he calls it an elite leadership class that has arisen, one with little interest in religion or local traditions or cultures. This elite group runs corporations, governments, universities, the media, and various cultural and professional establishments. He goes on to mm -hmm. talk about this process of secularization that basically means de-Christianization. Uh, as one of our popes has mm -hmm. warmed as well, uh, you know, Holy Father mm -hmm. uh, Benedict and also uh, uh, Pope Francis about, you know, especially in Europe and the Christian roots of Europe being uh, basically denied. Uh, and he goes on yeah. to say, and we recognize that often what is being canceled and corrected in these cancel culture and political correctness situations are basically perspectives that are rooted in Christian beliefs about human life and the human person, about marriage, the family, and more. Yeah, he's absolutely correct. Uh, exceedingly insightful uh, from a person who is very intelligent himself and um, well-educated. Uh, I would just uh, say, you know, when you think about an elite class, uh, what you're talking about is people who can promote each other, promote themselves. So they all have a certain level of education and they all have a, uh, because of that a certain level of influence and what happens is when these educated influencers uh, decide that they're going to have some kind of a common rooted uh, series of core beliefs uh, to formulate culture around uh, they can use their shared influence and their mutual influence. They can cause that cultural view, that set of beliefs, to rise above other views because they have control of technologies or they have control of the media or they have control of the educational establishment. And when they do this in a mutually corroborative way, they can change the culture and, and frankly, change the culture in ways that are not particularly particularly good for, as um, um, uh, Archbishop Gomez said, for religious people or good for people who have certain other cultural backgrounds that don't match what the elite culture's uh, views are. Now, in the, the elite culture, the tendency is always to move toward a greater sense of autonomy and freedom. Whether that's good or not, they, they, they don't analyze it. They just say, this is what we want. We want more autonomy and we want more freedom. And so what are we going to do? We're going to change cultural institutions that seem to impede that. Well, churches seem to impede autonomy and freedom. They say that somehow God ought to be involved in whether or not uh, a decision uh, should, or, you know, whether we should be free to do certain kinds of things. Or not just God being involved, or, you know, the good ought to be involved, or objective moral principles ought to be involved in whether or not we're going to uh, assess whether freedom is good here or not. I go back um, uh, to Solzhenitsyn's mm -hmm. uh, speech, I think it was way back in 76 or something uh, at Harvard University, mm -hmm. where he basically said, Yes, this is the same thing with the elite class. Yes, we are facing an elitist um, uh, movement, not just in the universities themselves, but as you pointed out, the media, the industrial establishment, etc. All these things, right? Eisenhower warning against that, you know, nice little bedtime relationship between the military and the industrial uh, complex. And so, again, we have... The, the, the same kind of collection of people, but now their orientation is to, uh, you know, optimize autonomy and freedom. Well, that's really great when you have a good education, a good job, and you're hanging around a lot of influential people. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, maximize autonomy. That, that, that sounds uh, uh, good. But, of course, uh, y you know, you have to subject yourself to some standards, or do you? Or just because you say it and you're the elite, does that mean it's good? 
or is there an objective standard of the good beyond yourself, an objective standard of the good that is established by God or religion or some kind of natural reasoning or by collective conscience, indeed conscience that's based on traditional and perennial principles that have turned out to represent the collective conscience, a conscience of people over the ages, over centuries, uh, you know, uh, and, and you can't, you're going to just uh, you're, say that because you want to have to be free from those kinds of traditional constraints, free from the constraints to objective principles, free from the constraints of religion, that everybody, this will be good for the culture, this will be good for all peoples, it'll be a travesty for all peoples. Peoples. As I just said, I'm finishing a book with Ignatius Press right now mm -hmm. uh, called The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, A Defense of Her Controversial Moral Teachings. And in that book, I very much talk about um, this uh, whole idea of what is happening in our culture as we elevate autonomy and freedom above objective standards of the good, above religion, above traditional uh, standards that reflect the collective conscience of people over generations. What happens when you say autonomy and freedom stands above all of it, we don't have to make recourse to any of it, what happens to the culture? Number one, we see a, an incredible decrease in the emotional health of people, marked by super rapid increases pre-COVID mm -hmm. of depression, anxiety, and a variety of other things, including suicides, homicides, etc. Per capita homicides and suicides, especially among young people, are skyrocketing out of sight. They're accelerating so fast. And you go, well, gee, what's going on here? Why would this be? They have more material wealth. They've got very good education. This is all pre-COVID. Why? Why would this be happening? And, of course, the idea is because culture is elevating freedom above the good, mm -hmm. objective standards of the good, above religion, and of course conscience is within us. There's a moral force and suasion, even as you know, people like Immanuel Kant would have said, are very clearly present in our being. There's something about conscience in which the divine is absolutely speaking through us with respect to these objective moral standards that we all hold in just about every culture around the world to be uh, true and good. Well, here's our problem then. I mean, in the elitist culture uh, where you, you say, well, we've got the influence to do it because we said it and we're the influencers, we're the educated, we proclaim it to be so. We proclaim it to be good because we said so. Skip the traditions, skip objective standards, skip principles, skip natural reasoning, skip religion, and skip the collective conscience of people. We're just asserting this. Autonomy and freedom are the basic values of our culture. You will see mm -hmm. it's not just going to be the emotional health of people that's going to be rapidly declining, but the spiritual health of people is rapidly declining. And if the spiritual and emotional health is declining, then relational health among people is going to be rapidly declining, in which case you're going to be coming to a cultural catastrophe in about 15 to 20 years. This is exactly what Solzhenitsyn was predicting. Mm -hmm. This is exactly... I I mean, it was almost uh, you know, prophetic and, and prescient, uh, you know, that, uh, as, as he was talking about it. But he had an analytical way of assessing what's wrong with all of this. Mm -hmm. Nobody can be independent of objective moral standards. Nobody can be independent of their conscience, right? Uh, I mean, they, well, they can assert themselves to be independent of their conscience. But, of course, if they don't listen to their conscience, they're not going to be the better for it. And they certainly aren't going to be better moral agents for doing that and, and, and so forth. So our, uh, our major point then is, is now that we've abandoned everything, that helped us to regulate ourselves, that helped us to move toward the most mm -hmm. loving things, that helped us to move toward the most responsible things, that helped us to move toward the good for others, the common good, the good for family, subsidiarity, everything else that our moral system is based on through the light of natural reason as well as the light of conscience and the light of religion and the light of tradition. All of it now mm -hmm. is subject, as it were, to the critical test of autonomy and human freedom has been cast right. aside. 
and it will literally lead to the destruction of our culture because it's leading to the destruction of relationships. I mean, you know, the divorce rate's out of sight. Marriage rates are cut in half, right? This, this is absurd what's going on in our culture. You start to look at what's going on in the emotional health, right? Skyrocketing, you know, 56% increases in suicide pre-COVID, right? 58% uh, 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 right. uh, increases in depression and anxiety, uh, you know, over like a 12-year period. We almost, you know, one and a half times Times the amount of depression, anxiety, suicide, substance abuse, familial tensions, decline in relationships, and of course, embedded in all of it is a decline in spirituality. Because with a decline in spirituality, there's also not just a decline in the relationship with God, but a decline in hope and a decline in, in a belief of, in, in, a, in a better uh, life, a decline in, in the moral standards, mm. uh, and, and a, uh, of course, a decline in covenant love, right. which religion has always promoted through the family. Right. So all these things, it's a crisis. Right. And, and you're, you're, you know, Archbishop Gomez is correct. Right. I mean, we, we just got to, we got to start speaking truth here uh, to, the, to the elite powers uh, right. and just uh, tell them, you are not doing anything well by us. Uh, this is just an exertion of your own autonomous uh, influence, and you might get some but, narcissistic but, but, pleasure but, from but, it, but, but it's father, killing us. You know, I'm, their intentions are good. Come on. Isn't, <laughs> isn't that what really matters yeah. these days? As long as your intentions yeah. were good, you know, yeah, what did they say? What did Lenin, Lenin say? you got to break a few eggs if you yeah. want to make an omelet. Yeah, that's, you know, I that's mean, right. That's, that's kind of how yeah. it happens. But the, yeah, at the end of the day, it'll be good for you. The road to hell you. is paved with those good, good intentions. Right, yeah. You don't hear that very often anymore. A lot <laughs> yeah. of people are, you know, kind of yeah. uh, hide behind good, in, good intentions instead yeah. of looking yeah. at the outcome. And a lot of that, I wonder, you know, we've been living even with the COVID where you could look now and say some of the pronouncements that have come out at different times uh, apparently, we weren't always being told exactly the truth about different things. And it kind of was, well, that's because, you know, this we were afraid people would think this or that. And, and it kind of leads people to start to wonder, what can I trust? And that's a big problem we have in the, in the culture period today, isn't it? Oh, yeah. But, I mean, what can you trust? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what you can trust. Uh, when you're, you have, on the one hand, you've got religion consistent traditional moral teaching and your conscience speaking to you on the one hand versus the media, which is incredibly influenced by, of course, commercial and uh, money and so forth, except for uh, stations like EWTN, which obviously have a religious purpose. But, but the, the key thing is, is you've got media on the other hand, you've got marketing enterprises and industrialists on the other, uh, and on the other hand, et cetera. You're going to, okay, who do you trust? Mm -hmm. you know, it, now, what if the educational establishment is basically perpetuating the very same thought as the industrial, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, woke uh, movement and the very same thought um, and uh, as the marketers and, and the commercial, um, you know, magnates mm -hmm. of, of the media are doing, right, you begin to suspect for just a second, hey, maybe the elites in the academe world are on the wrong side. Mm -hmm. Maybe their backing of autonomy and freedom over morality and religion and conscience and family, maybe this is just not just a fraud, maybe this is the most upside down evil that has mm -hmm. been perpetrated on society in, in, in centuries. And, and the fact that, let's not be suckered by it. Mm -hmm. Just because influential people or the media says it's good or somebody gives that great principle, everybody's doing it so it can't be all bad, etc., right. etc., cetera, et cetera, that, that famous end justifies the means principle, mm -hmm. right? The, the idea then is uh, at the end of the day, we've got to challenge it. That's mm -hmm. what we as Christians have to do, just say, hey, stop it. You know, you haven't disproven anything. You haven't disproven God. You haven't disproven religion. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's more evidence for God today than there's ever been. There's more evidence today that morality is good for you, good for your emotional well, health, your relational health, your spiritual health, so and cultural why, health than ever so before. Why don't, so why doesn't the culture react to that? Is it cognitive dissonance? Is it just running contrary to what they already believe? Or is it contrary to what they want to believe? 
I think two things. Number one, I think there's a huge lemming effect that goes on in the culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in other words, a lot of people follow the followers who are following the previous followers, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I think you have a lot of people unwilling to get out of the so-called mainstream. Mm -hmm. They're unwilling uh, to, to kind of break with the common thought patterns and belief patterns because they don't want to become unpopular. Right. Uh, you know, when uh, Christopher Lash talked about the culture of na narcissism, a former Marxist, by the way, mm -hmm. who, you know, has now kind of come to his senses in, in some ways. But at the time, you know, he wrote that book, The Culture of Narcissism, and this is exactly what he feared, mm -hmm. you know, that, right, for our narcissistic purposes, uh, we basically will follow anybody, we'll believe the, the, the leading thing, we don't want to be unpopular, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we don't want to get ourselves rejected by anybody who's in the in-group, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that's going on. And secondly, of course, you know, autonomy and freedom, hey, what's wrong with that? No self-restraint whatsoever. Yeah, uh, just go out and have sex with whoever you want. Uh, just go out and steal things from people who are uh, basically innocent victims. You know, just go out and perpetrate a lie, you know, if it suits you. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, I mean, what should be restricting my freedom? All these laws about lies and stealing and, mm -hmm. and adultery, you know, all those things are a thing of the past. Today, what really matters is we're free. What really matters is you should be able to do whatever you need to do so long as it doesn't harm anybody too much. And I'll leave the interpretation of the too much right. up to you. I mean, right. come on. I mean, this is culture of narcissism writ large. Well, That's you know, I problem. remember just recently uh, a politician from Nevada died, and one of the famous stories on him was the fact that he had espoused the idea when Governor Romney was running for president that he hadn't paid his taxes and he was a rich guy wasn't paying his taxes turned out later it was totally untrue and he was actually challenged yeah. about it and his answer was well he lost didn't he yeah and justifies means absolutely all over again yep absolutely yep. doesn't matter whether it's good or right. not right exactly you know? got me what I wanted to get so that got okay. me what I wanted to get and right. I deserve it because I'm free and you guys ought to submit to whatever I want. Right. So just remember, just remember the old autonomy and freedom thing always winds up backfiring on you. What goes around comes around. You think you're getting your freedom, but just remember you're undermining all of the restraints that are based in culture that are seeking the good of everybody, the common right. good, those basic moral principles, those basic religious principles oriented toward love and family, mm -hmm. toward the good and the objective good, and toward the widow and the orphan. All of those things, you reject them all, you say you don't have to be responsible to any of them, just remember, son Roper, as Thomas More said, mm -hmm. just remember, get rid of all those trees that you cut down in order to pursue the devil what happens when he turns back on you and you have no defense to hide behind right. well that's what's happening remember you take out all those objective moral principles and all those religious principles you take out belief and hope it's going to come back to haunt you right. you think you're going to be in the super elite uh, there's a wonderful book written by C.S. Lewis called That Hideous Strength. Mm -hmm. And the super elite are kind of in a group called The Nice. I don't want to destroy the book for you. Mm -hmm. Could give you nightmares really reading about it. But the nice were not so nice. <laughs> they basically, at the end of the day, it was everybody for himself. Mm -hmm. And of course, they all destroy themselves. But you have to read the book. Right. But uh, it, it's the basic theme is, yeah, you, you right. say you want extra freedom and for this autonomy and freedom to overrule all traditional moralities and, and traditions and, and uh, objective moral principles right. and religion and uh, the collective conscience of people. Do you think right. it can overrule it? Well, boy, you know, you destroy all those things. There's nothing to, to protect you when the super, super, super elite come back on just the super elite and the elite, and they'll subjugate you, and they'll treat you like slaves right. for the benefit of their own freedom, their own autonomy. 
to get what they wanted. Right. And uh, we, I've belabored this subject. Enough, right. Well, I'm that's sure. okay. As Little Red Riding Hood <laughs> learned in Into the Woods, the musical "Nice yeah. is different than good." I thought that was always yeah. What I was saying. So <laughs> let's great. move. Let's move on to uh, some questions from our viewers. Uh, uh, without yeah. putting you on the spot, dear Father Spitzer, you're not a canon lawyer, but I heard of a priest who left the church and became an Episcopalian priest. Does transubstantiation still occur because of his Catholic orders, George? No, it does. No, it does not. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, he's still a priest forever in the Catholic Church in that sense. But no, I mean, once you shift rights and become part of another right, no, the transubstantiation. Uh, doesn't occur because of your orders. No. Okay, very good. Next up, a uh, person writes to us, Dear Father Spitzer, I go to Mass daily, uh, and there's no morning Mass in my parish and none close by, so I attend the Vigil Mass on Saturday evenings and then go to Mass the next morning for my Sunday obligation. I was told I cannot receive communion on Sunday if I received at the Saturday Vigil, the reason being they were the same Mass. This doesn't seem correct to me. Terry. It's not correct. That's, uh, uh, you're absolutely correct. Whoever said that to you, uh, technically speaking, it is the same Mass, but you're attending on two different days, and you're attending with a different purpose and so forth and on both days. So uh, don't you worry one's uh, right. uh, shred about that. To receive and to communicate frequently on two different days is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. By the way, a tradition that goes all the way back uh, well before... Um, you know, to, uh, to the uh, 13th century with uh, Thomas Akempis and so many others. I mean, uh, the whole idea of frequent communion has been very much uh, proposed by the Catholic Church and promoted by the Catholic right. Church. So you keep doing what you're doing. You're doing exactly the right thing. And whoever said that to you is definitely misinformed. Okay. Next up, another question. Dear Father Spitzer, I don't really understand why in biblical times... God was pleased with animal sacrifices. This is a mystery to me as it seems the animals suffered needlessly for the sins of men. I'm an avid animal lover and repulsed at the thought of animal suffering. This is from Maria. Well, Maria, I mean, you know, you have to remember the old scholastic exp uh, medieval expression, right? Whatever is received is received in the manner of the receiver. So, you know, in previous cultures, um, you know, the idea of... Uh, animal sacrifice, nothing was, you know, seen as wrong with it. In fact, it was never really um, prohibited by uh, any writ of conscience or by any religion um, in particular. And um, because, of course, a animals are not held to be a, a, in the same ontological level as mm. humans. Now, that doesn't mean we should go out and be cruel to animals. Mm. And today we have a much different recognition, of course, of uh, animal pain and the worth of animals and, and being respectful to animals, and we certainly do not do animal sacrifice. But again, you have to put yourself back into that other culture. Right. And when you put yourself back into that culture, they certainly uh, didn't know any better. And remember, uh, you know, God works through human agents. Mm -hmm. That is the whole idea, right, in terms of, you know, uh, um, you know the development of of culture and the development of our thinking. So God, you know, works with the uh, with um, uh, the capacities and, and the value systems that people have, uh, right? And um, and so uh, at, at the time, so uh, in like the fifth century B.C. or uh, you know prior to that time, yes, animal sacrifice was thought to be a loving gesture toward God. As they understood it, this was sacrificing something that really mattered to them. Right. It was a proof of their love. It was what they used to sustain themselves. And it wasn't like those animals were going to not be, in some sense, killed. Right. <clears throat> animals were around to be eaten. Right. They weren't pets. Animals, uh, you know, it's not they like weren't pets. Pet. Right, right. Exactly. And so th this was... Like, I'm taking my sustenance and I'm giving it to God as a proof of my love and mm. my faith in God. Right. And so in that viewpoint, um, you know, you can see that that would be perfectly acceptable right. to God 
within that historical cultural context. And certainly a step up from uh, baby sacrifice or infant sacrifice or human sacrifice. Oh. Oh, which that's obviously true. was going on uh, in different parts yep, of the world, that, certainly as uh, absolutely. We, we know from the Aztecs, even in, the, oh, in yes. this hemisphere oh, yes. here. So. Yep, and also uh, we can see it even, you know, in the Semitic peoples that surrounded right. the people of the Old Testament. Yeah, mm -hmm. good old Baal and his, uh, and his yep. people there, right? So we're going to take correct. a break on that note. Much more ahead with mm -hmm. Father Spitzer, more of your questions. And then we'll be talking about the devil, so stay with us. And we do appreciate you staying with us here in Father Spitzer's universe, talking about the signs of demonic possession from Father's book, Christ vs. Satan, in our daily lives, finishing up some of your questions from prior programs. In a similar vein to that last question, somebody uh, made the point in his letter, Dear Father Spitzer, the Humane Society in my city does not allow you to abort kittens or puppies in the wombs of their mothers because they're alive and it's killing them. Why do people have a hard time believing then that baby people in the womb of their mothers are alive and aborting them is killing. Barb. Well, I mean, you've got the, uh, right. the right idea there. <clears throat> and um, uh, certainly human beings uh, in the eyes of God are worth a lot more than an animal uh, is. Not disdaining a perfectly nice animal, but human beings have a soul. Human beings are transcendental uh, creation. Human beings have self-consciousness unlike that of any animal. Human beings have conceptual consciousness and intelligence and rationality. And above all, they've got moral conscience. And because they have all of these things, the Creator intended them to live. <clears throat> and the Creator intended that the value of their life, the eternal value of their life, be respected from the very moment of fertilization slash conception to natural death. So the idea, um, you know, is uh, you are right on the marker mm -hmm. and um, uh, continue to uh, needle people with uh, the obvious truth right, right. Uh, that the Humane Society has seen, but apparently uh, our medical or parts of our medical establishment have right. not. Right, absolutely. Another question, dear Father Spitzer, I know that the church teaches that the end does not justify the means, kind of what we talked mm -hmm. about before, or we cannot commit evil to bring about a good result. But is it, is this not what God does when he permits evil and then brings good from that evil? Kate. Well, Kate, no, that's uh, when God permits evil, right, um, he's not committing it. So the, the idea in, in moral theology is you have to intend evil. So that's why the principle of double effect works, uh, Katie. So, for example, um, you know, uh, uh, you can say, well, I'm giving this person some morphine, right, in order to control their pain. That is what I'm intending. Mm -hmm. Now, you just might give them that extra dose because they're in, writhing in pain. You give them an extra dose of the morphine. All of a sudden, you hit past the therapeutic index, and then the next thing you know, yeah, that person dies. Mm -hmm. You didn't intend to kill them. The reason you gave them the morphine was not to kill them, but to control their pain. The double effect, the secondary effect, was that you killed them accidentally without intention. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing to notice. Intention is the big thing. Mm -hmm. When God permits an evil, it doesn't mean he's intending to do it. Now, there was, you know, in, in, in the past, there wasn't a proper respect for secondary causality, right, where God kind of puts some natural causes in the world and allows, you know, um, uh, human beings to be free. And so in the confluence of natural um, laws and in the confluence of human freedom, uh, evil things can happen to people. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, God allows... Um, suffering to happen to people through natural causes because actually suffering is something that helps us to move out of ourselves, out of our egos, out of our superficiality to a, a notion of the common good. 
to to move you know to, to, to sacrifice ourselves for something that's noble well if you can't possibly suffer loss mm -hmm. you can't possibly suffer pain how in the world could you even do something noble for anybody mm -hmm. how could you make a sacrifice for anybody how could you prove your metal and your values right how could you even express some form of courage right we would all be like little babies you know kind of in a pleasure bubble mm -hmm. uh, never graduating from it because God wouldn't dare to let anything troublesome happen to us but God does dare uh, you know, um, to allow uh, uh, something troublesome to happen to us because we're not made for this life. We're made for an eternal life of unconditional love, which means we need to be purified from our ego, from our sensuality, from our narcissism. We got to be purified from those things and move into a, a kind of a life um, that is going to be a freely chosen good. Can the, 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 the uh, imperfectness of the natural order mm -hmm. help us to do that? Help us to form the common good? Help us to detach from our egos and narcissism? Help us to move beyond superficial life stuff to something courageous, something noble, something worth sacrificing for, something to give ourselves totally for, like our families, like our values, like our, our religion, like our country, whatever. Of course, mm -hmm. that's what the, it's all about. It's not about this life. It's about eternal life in unconditional love, unperturbed by egoism and sensuality in the next. That's what we're here for. That's what God is allowing these challenges in our lives uh, to be oriented around. So, um, you know, the idea that God permits it is he's not intending to do us some malice, some uh, terrible thing. God is permitting challenges to, to, uh, to uh, you know, face, to be faced by us so that we can eventually establish who we are in our freedom. Are we people who will stay by our values? Are we people who will stay by our families? Are we people who will get out of ourselves and choose an unselfish love uh, as our highest value? Are we people who would sacrifice ourselves for God, for our eternity, for the values of God? Are we people, you know, who are like that? Or are we people who just don't want to suffer? We want to live in the pleasure bubble. Please don't bug me. I'm really happy here. Give me another hit of morphine, please. Give me another banana cream pie, one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's call it a day. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not life. That's what God would never doom us to such superficiality. He would call us to the overcoming in, of our, within our freedom to overcome the very evil um, and, and the, the very narcissistic, e egocentric, and, mm -hmm. and irreligious kinds of, uh, you know, thoughts that we have uh, for our own benefit. Mm -hmm. And we would, uh, we think will be for our own benefit, of course, which would undermine us in the long run. And he wouldn't, he, he calls us away from that mm -hmm. in our freedom to choose life rather than death, mm -hmm. even at great sacrifice, to choose values and goodness and religion over against the possibility of suffering and challenge and death because it's the noble thing mm -hmm. to do. It's worthy of us. It will define not only um, who we are in this world, mm -hmm. it will define ultimately who we will be in all eternity. So that's really, mm -hmm. Katie, that's the whole thing. And really, when you talk about, you know, um, uh, God, you know, uh, um, not intending evil, like in right. the case I mentioned. It's all about intentionality, and God is not intending us malice. He's not intending evil towards us. He allows us to face challenges, so that those challenges will, in turn, help us to define ourselves and to define who we will be in all eternity with Him. Okay, very good. Let's move on to the book. Uh, uh, Christ versus mm -hmm. Satan in our daily lives, page one forty-five. Last week we were talking about my concern about excessive weight as being one of the uh, <laughs> issues uh, right. after poltergeist and levitation. Uh, then we kind of came out on the idea of telepathy. And I know you were yeah. talking last week about uh, in one particular case, a person be able to actually, well, in that case, actually inserted themselves into a phone call they weren't on, right? 
Oh, yeah, no, that's right. And, uh, you know, uh, the telepathy is quite remarkable. Um, it, you know, I, obviously, you know, the t they also can know what you are thinking at a distance. And so, uh, uh, you know, you come into the room to begin the, art, the, the, the exorcism once again, and the next thing you know, uh, this uh, person who looks like a, a, an ordinary human being, but of course has these demonic powers, is telling you what you were thinking about or what you were saying on the phone or what you were talking to so-and-so about who wasn't even, you know, nearby in any way, shape, or form. So, and they can know even truths about your history, uh, you know, what you did in the past. And of course, uh, you know, that's... You know, that's the first trick of the demons is to try and undermine the confidence of the exorcist by saying, aha, in your past you did this, and in your past, you're, and therefore you are defined by your past. You're right. nothing more than whatever you did in your past. And so, of course, uh, the experienced exorcist just uh, right. says, you know. Because um, that's, that in be some way is, is how we're all attacked, you know, when we're Okay, doing sure. things or not doing things or standing yeah. up for something and kind of getting the, who are you to talk? Yeah. Uh, you know, what yeah, about exactly. the things you've done, you know? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, who do you think you are exercising me? You're just as evil. Huh. Right. Not really. <laughs> not at all uh, because, of course, you're on the side now of good and you've changed, you've right. converted. And that's the whole thing. There's always possibility for conversion. And frankly, a whole lot of people engage in that possibility of conversion right. uh, for the, their own, not only eternal goodness, but for the beneficence they can bring to right. others and to the world now. And that's why sometimes people who are in that transition are accused of being hypocrites because they say, well, you can't oh, do yeah. these things. It's kind of like the St. Augustine. Well, it was great. He got, uh, he had a good time. And then as he got a little older, he decided he, he was now going to make it yeah. uh, uh, a bad time for everybody else because he already had his yeah. good time. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I could see how people would make the accusation. Mm. And I'm sure people actually said it to old uh, mm. uh, St. Augustine as he was right in the midst of his transition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, who are you to talk? You know, you, you engaged in all of these things. And he did. Mm -hmm. But look at the confessions. He admits it ahead of time. He just says, hey, I'm admitting I did all these things, you know, but um, here's how I was converted. Here's how the Lord introduced himself into my life and of course through the prayers of my mother very important and of course through that uh, I changed my mind and I freely chose to move in another direction toward Christ our Lord and I do not regret it and you cannot take away the goodness of that transition simply because of what I did in the past I mean what I did in the past Christ has paid for what I did in the past you can also do with your past you can leave it behind and you can pursue in obedience, the Lord of life and love, the Lord Jesus Christ. Very good. That's a positive thing for us all to keep in mind. You also talk about the appearance of dark figures, and you also talk about remarkable yep. strength can be exhibited, etc. Then we move on to the effects of possessed people on other people, and you and you talk about the you know the Robbie Mannheim case, uh, you know which was kind of the movie The Exorcist was based on. Mm -hmm. But you also talk about this one that happened, I think, in 07. Uh, mm -hmm. of a woman whose name actually wasn't Julia, but the name Julia yeah. is used. Uh, why did you mm -hmm. decide to so, focus on that particular story? Uh, because Richard, uh, Dr. Richard Gallagher, who is a well-known psychiatrist and had witnessed many uh, exorcisms, had written about it in New Oxford Review, and I just thought, okay, this whole case is beyond dispute, really, uh, just because of the source. And uh, also because she was a high priestess uh, in a satanic cult, and, um, you know, uh, what I found interesting about it was, in many ways, she kind of looked normal um, before you began to listen closely to what she was saying. Um, but she didn't look like she was possessed until she went into her trance. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, as uh, Dr. Gallagher says, he saw her just levitating right mm -hmm. off the ground. <clears throat> and he heard the cruelties that were just kind of welling up from within her. And, you know, she even talks about, you know, uh, uh, abortion really being, quote unquote, uh, really scare quotes, the sacrament of the devil, mm -hmm. right? The, the idea that, um, you know, that uh, uh, abortion is one of the key things and how she was kind of a, um, a provider, you know, she provided babies that could then be 
uh, either aborted or babies that could be sacrificed and talked about, you know, um, uh, how the, the ex extinguishing of life is part of the satanic uh, cult. So I, I thought, okay, this, this basically, this case brings to light a lot of what people think is just sheer nonsense. Mm -hmm. But it's not nonsense. I mean, it's, it's, this is what goes on in satanic cults. Mm -hmm. If you want to go ahead and engage in that, uh, you ought to think this through because it is the sacrament. Abortion it is a sacrament of uh, the evil spirit. It really is one of the key manifestations of the killing of innocent life for what? Some kind of power that you can have, some kind of influence that you can have in the satanic cult. Of course, anytime you see those kinds of things, it's not just for power. It could just be for convenience. Mm -hmm. I don't need a kid right now. I think I gotta move beyond this. Uh, I can get rid of that kid. Mm -hmm. Just know what spirit is sitting behind that. Mm -hmm. It's not just the convenience thing. It's not just the the fear thing. Of course, the devil uses fear, convenience, right. and all kinds of things. But it's to his great delight that such an evil like the murdering of an innocent human being is being perpetrated for the sake of sheer, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, personal satisfaction or personal um, need. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he uh, quote unquote, need. You it's, know, it, he, it's he interesting. loves it. Right, it's interesting too that you make the point that she was a former Catholic. I wonder if that yeah. was something that ultimately helped her in a sense because she, she turned to yeah. the church for an exorcist. Yeah, I think it did. Yeah. I absolutely think it did. I think at some point, something in her Catholic background <clears throat> clicked. And when it clicked, she kind of went, oh, my gosh, I'm in trouble. I'm not just in trouble because, you know, the, the, the people in my cult are uh, uh, kind of, you know, looking over everything I'm doing and, uh, you know, and, and are suspicious of me continuously. And they could easily do me violence and evil. But I'm in trouble because of my eternal life. I'm in trouble because I have cast off God. I'm in trouble because I've turned not only my back on him, I have undermined him at every possible station. I'm in trouble for my whole eternity. And she begins to feel then what the devil has been cloaking over the entire time. The emptiness, the alienation, the loneliness, the deep dread that begins to happen when the devil's a little, um, you know, uh, as they say, glossing overs, the devil's little pleasures, the devil's little power trips suddenly cease to be as influential as they used to be mm -hmm. when they sort of have worn out their welcome. Suddenly you feel the dread coming upon you. And I think she did, and I think mm -hmm. her Catholic background very much helped her to do so. Now, you, you talk about here in, the, in him dealing uh, uh, Richard Gallagher, world's best experts mm -hmm. in distinguishing true de demonic possession from psychiatric conditions that look like possession. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the idea of a couple of categories, chronic psychotic disorders, personality or character disorders, and then severely histrionic or disassociate individuals now these would be but psychiatric cases that would that wouldn't be possession that's correct and so but there are real signs uh, of that for example that would not have been in Julia so you know when you see Julia she was quite uh, controlled uh, right she wasn't having um, you know paranoia visions uh, she wasn't out of control having a sense of reality about herself that was completely different than what she was living. So she wasn't, you know, um, uh, you know, psychotic or schizophrenic, uh, you know, out of control. She had real, you know, freedom. She had self-control. Uh, there's no question. Of course, she feels the dread of all of these things. And when the devil wants to just jerk her chain, he did. You know, and he could just literally throw her into a trance and throw her into, you know, a, a demonic mode mm -hmm. where she was levitating off the bed or she was, you know, doing uh, uh, and uttering just terrible, terrible things, which in many ways she had promoted throughout her life. But mm -hmm. now she's trying to change 
and he's going, oh, no, you don't, honey. Uh, I've got a hold of you after a, a while here, and I'm going to jerk that chain again. You're my slave. You gave yourself over to me for power and for knowledge and, <clears throat> you know, these kinds of things. I'm now in control. I'm jerking the chain. And if she had seen it through, the exorcism through, to the point, now remember that every, anybody who gets an exorcism, <clears throat> they have to freely cooperate with it mm -hmm. when they're not in a trance state. So when they're not in a trance state, you know, the idea is to get Robbie to go to confession and, the, you know, and to get him to receive Holy Communion freely and knowingly. And, uh, of course, the devil's going to try it, it, everything he can to prevent that. But eventually, because the exorcists <clears throat> knew what they were doing, they got mm -hmm. Robbie to confession. They got him to do the, um, you know, the uh, act of contrition uh, meaningfully. They got him to receive a little piece of the sacrament. First, they had to start with spiritual communion because any time the host approached, you know, the, the rage and the, you know, terrible things would start all over again. But eventually... Um, they were able to get him to receive and on Easter mm -hmm. Monday, Monday after Easter, uh, he of course snapped out of it in that very dramatic scene where St. Michael is standing um, over him mm -hmm. and uh, is commanding literally the devil uh, to leave um, uh, him mm -hmm. and uh, then boom, almost like a big clap of thunder and a huge burst of light, uh, the, you know, the... Uh, the devil emerges, and Robbie actually returned to normal, uh, never did uh, go back uh, to uh, his former state. But mm -hmm. the point um, is that you, you need freedom mm -hmm. um, uh, to be exercised, and you need to put your faith in God. Confession is so important. Holy Communion is so important. And, you know, you can tell that to a person who is possessed. And like, you know, you can just say, you have to go to confession. Mm -hmm. You have to get there. But, you know, if the person doesn't get to confession, if they're very far along, they're going to think of every reason why not to go to confession. Right. Everything, the devil is just heating it up. It's going to be bad. <clears throat> People will think the wrong thing about you. Hey, you're possessed. What could anybody... You know, <clears throat> think bad about you. You know, <coughs> mm -hmm. confess what you will. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we already know you're in the throes of a terrible, evil, uh, you know, thing. Something right. you've allowed evil into your life. So what's the problem? But why would you even think that? But people do. They're just, they're so resistant. Well, they don't want to do that sacrament, even though they know it's their liberation. You can be talking to them, you know, in person. You can be talking mm -hmm. to them on the phone. Just do the confession. Please do the confession. You come back, they call you back again, they go, you go, well, did you do the confession? Well, not yet. Right. You know, don't ask me for more advice until right. you go to confession. Just but do that's it. the whole point. Right. Just, just do it. Do it. You Stop have to thinking. Stop. Don't think about it. Just, just yep. do it. Jump in, so to speak. Yep. What's interesting, just as yep. we go out, is she actually stopped the exorcism after, I think it was yep. eight times, uh, yeah. and then ultimately wanted to get back in, but uh, apparently she had died. But it's interesting because yeah. apparently they thought the reason she had backed out was she was a, she didn't want to give up her powers. Yeah, I think that's a huge, huge deal. I mean, she was caught between a rock and a hard place. She basically, on the one hand, she wanted this, those powers, which were very seductive, right? Mm -hmm. She had uh, telepathic powers. She had knowledge of people's personal lives. She could uh, definitely control um, objects at a distance. Uh, she, of course, the voice on the telephone that you mentioned, et cetera, and so forth. So all of these things she did like, and that seems to have been part of the deal. Right. On the uh, other hand, uh, she also probably had a great deal of fear right. from her cult that if she had tried to turn that they probably would have done violence to her uh, if she tried to turn. So she may have, those two things might have combined. Uh, on the other hand, of course, she just stops it seemingly voluntarily. Right. And so um, looks like, um, you know, the dread was terrible, but she decided she right. would endure the dread and e endure an eternity of that dread and suffering 
with her evil master right. rather than continue um, along the lines, give up her powers or right. suffer whatever threat uh, the cult Absolutely. Um, had uh, well, threatened her with. Sometimes, uh, you know, we, we want to get out, but we don't want to change. But that being said, well, Father, if you give us your <laughs> yeah. blessing out the door, that'd be great. Yeah, that's so true, by the way, Doug. Yes, bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord, uh, who is consolation, may the Lord who protects you from evil continue to reach into your life through your sacrament, through the, your reception of the sacraments, through your prayer, and through your obedience to his word, so that you might grow ever and ever closer to him, more protected from that spirit and lead people away from that evil spirit into the full light and love of God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen, Father. We shall see you next week and we hopefully will see you as well. Don't forget, Father Spitzer's books and videos available through the E.W. Tim Religious Catalog. We'll continue on with our topic. Our bookmark this week, The Abolition of Woman, How Radical Feminism is Betraying Women by Fiorella Nash from the UK. And we've got The Mass of the Americas live from the old St. Pat's Cathedral in New York City with Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni as the main celebrant a Novus Ordo Latin Solemn Pontifical High Mass with the Benedict 16 Choir and Orchestra, Saturday, January 15th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Well worth checking out. And we shall see you next time when we once more re-enter Father Spitzer's universe. We hope you see you then.